my faculty colleagues, staff, and dear students. Let me welcome you all to this today's event of World Population Day Symposium 2022. But in fact, three events are happening together at IAPS now. One is that this is the inauguration of our new academic year activities 22-23. So let me welcome all the new students. We have uh, three batches of master's students joining today and also 37 PhD scholars are also joining today to the program and to the institute today. So let me <laughs> being admitted into this prestigious institution through a highly competitive process and I am sure all of you will academically and personally benefit from your uh, studies here and so on this occasion let me welcome you to this program. Let me also extend a warm welcome to our second year master students. They are also perhaps first time coming to the campus today because last year because of the COVID and we could not uh, host you here on the campus but now all of you are here I am sure you will enjoy the atmosphere and the facilities and the campus life very much. So let me heartily welcome all of you to this. The July 11th, all over the world, we observe as the World Population Day. And in order to create awareness about world population activities, world population issues, and to generate discussions and debate, from the governments to non-governmental organizations to academic institutions and United Nations take the lead in organizing all these things. So this year also we are going having a last two years we had the online symposium but now this time we are back to the activities. So we will have a symposium on various aspects of the World Population Day and the population scenario. Uh, we have uh, Professor Vegard Skirberg, a well-known Norwegian economist and a demographer, currently with the Columbia University, will be speaking to us on this occasion on the low fertility scenario in India and its implications. Thank you, Professor Vegard, for accepting our invitation and coming here for this. So, which also mainly speaks about what is the quality changes we want in this population. I think all of you being a student of this population studies in this institute, I think ultimately all of our aim is to really see that the country or the world achieves what is expected to be achieved, that is the progress of the human being in terms of its quality, in terms of its education, in terms of its health care, in terms of all other characteristics which we will be studying and we will be trying to see how it can be advanced to our research, to our studies, as well as all of your great efforts. So welcome once again to the Institute. I'm sure the coming one year of academic journey for you will be very pleasant, will be stimulating in terms of your academic growth, as well as will be able to get you to the desired destination for which you have enrolled in this institute. So thanks also to Vegard for accepting our invitation and coming to the institute and I'm sure 
Bugard being one of the pioneers in also in the population projection initially when he was Vyasa, as well as in his research in, in the aging and currently the family demography. I think these are also the areas very much at the heart of this institute, the institute's research and themes, and as well as in our teaching. So your current recent books also really as one of our the reference book for most of the students who would be really now learning the demography, especially on the fertility transition. Thank you for coming over. We look forward to your talk. And once again, I thank all of you for joining and also a happy World Population Day. Thank you so much. Uh, World Population Day and also the release of the, with the release of the new Human Population Production Data. Um, thank you, Professor James, for inviting me. Thank you, um, Professor Seti, for for for, uh, for organizing everything and for having me here, and also to Professor Kogi for for um, for making uh, this trip possible. I will be speaking. I, I worked uh, quite diversely in different issues, so different themes in demography. And one topic I've been focusing on in recent years have been on, on fertility. And I've been trying to uh, set up a new institute in Oslo, in Norway, on uh, focusing on both the demographic and um, biological and social uh, determinants of low fertility and changes in fertility patterns. And the motivation for why, why we're currently focusing on fertility is, uh, is a graph that many of you probably know quite well. Uh, so since since the 1950s, the globe from around five uh, children per woman to around two and a half or less uh, children per woman in, in recent years. Um, and understanding why this is the case and why, why fertility might continue to decline globally, but also uh, locally in different uh, regions and contexts, and, and why many attempts to perhaps reverse the ongoing fertility trends, which are attempted in many low fertility settings, might be, um, might be difficult to implement or less effective. So this graph shows, um, shows the, um, um, can you see my pointer? Well, anyway, so, so this, uh, this uh, uh, shows the uh, uh, latest round of the NFHS. Thank you. And, uh, and it, shows, um, um, it shows the very large differences in fertility observed in India from, in, in for example, Bihar, you have the highest fertility in India with uh, a TFR of 3.0. Uh, a region close by in Sikkim is, has only 1.1 1 .1, uh, children per woman. And why do we observe these large differences within uh, a relatively um, short geographic uh, distance. Uh, that is something that could be of interest to, to study in more detail in, in the years to come, and whether India will experience a fertility convergence, uh, which many demo demographers uh, believe, at least partially, could be the case. So the point of my talk is uh, twofold, is, is to understand why are we having fewer children in the world, why is fertility declining, and also what are the um, what are the biological changes in the capacity to, to reproduce? Uh, and what are the social factors? Uh, what are the social key factors driving later and lower fertility? I will give many examples from Europe and Norway, partly because Norway is my home country, but also because Norway has some of the best data on reproduction in the world. We have the data on the entire population linked to both social and biological national level data, which is quite unique. So this shows one example of uh, a fertility change that has occurred since 1986 to 2020 in Norway. And you saw that, see that in 1986, most women in Norway, as in many other countries, had uh, uh, children quite early uh, relative to now. They had the peak fertility occurred in the, in the 20s. Um, since the 1980s, during the 1990s, Fertility has uh, been postponed, so now peak fertility occurs in the early 30s. There's been a strong decrease in um, not only teenage fertility. Teenage fertility is almost unheard of in Norway. It used to be very high, uh, or quite high. It used to be um, um, uh, over 16, uh, going back to the 50s, and now it's, it's fallen down to below 2. Um, and um, you have um, uh, peak fertility.
occurring in the early 30s and increases in fertility not only in the late 30s but also in the early and uh, later 40s, although to quite low levels. This, is all, this also correlates to a um, strong increase in the percentage of live births to mothers age 35 plus in Norway, uh, and now more than 20% uh, uh, of all births occur to, to mothers uh, aged 35 plus. So these were the trends. And when asked, so I will focus on biological issues in a bit, but when asked what is the preferred age for first birth, when a general population is asked how uh, what is the best age to have, have a child for both uh, men and women? You find that um, uh, people, um, also that is both uh, uh, men and women, uh, also that uh, the ideal age of first birth should occur after the age of 27 roughly, and uh, not later than the age of 37, so roughly a decade seen as, uh, as uh, optimum. And these are the um, shares of, uh, so there's been a strong increase in childlessness in, in Europe and in Asia, East Asia in particular. Uh, highest is uh, Japan, where more than one in four women uh, age 40 are now childless, followed by Singapore and then uh, uh, continental and southern European countries, including Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, Finland. Uh, but there's also examples of countries in former um, uh, socialist, um, uh, from former Soviet uh, countries, including um, uh, Russia, um, um, Lithuania, and many other countries where fertility, even if overall fertility is quite low, uh, childlessness is not that high. And the reason is that uh, most women have one child, but many do not have um, subsequent children. So there could be different reasons for why fertility is Low in, um, uh, quite low in different countries. Some countries you have a high proportion of childless, other, other countries you have high proportions of women not proceeding from the first birth. There's also an interesting gender dimension, and this is, uh, I think, quite important uh, and something that has happened in recent years in Norway. So, childlessness used to be uh, almost all research on childlessness uh, or in, uh, used to be on, on women. Uh, much stronger for men. Well, almost one out of three men in Norway are now childless at the end of their reproductive years. And the increase has been much, uh, has been there also for women, but much weaker, uh, going from 10 to uh, slightly above 15%. So childlessness is an increasingly a male phenomenon. And this is important for many reasons, including that uh, there is, uh, uh, if, if you look at, for example, the relationship between adult health and childlessness in, in uh, Norway, you find that the relationship is actually stronger for men than for women. So childlessness can have stronger implications for adult male health than for adult female. And the reasons are likely to be uh, related to, to social support or, or uh, meaning, purpose in life or, or, or um, uh, health behavior risk factors. Women uh, who are childless might, uh, might take greater risks and, and end up living shorter lives. I'd like to give a big perspective, and um, this is, um, um, this is uh, an example from Denmark where we look at gross and net fertility. Gross fertility is the number of children uh, of both sexes, the blue line, uh, who are born to, uh, on average, and the red line shows the number of women, uh, children, surviving to mid-reproductive periods, uh, to the mid-reproductive period. And, and what you find is that the, um, if you go back to the beginning of the demographic transition, 1775, you find that uh, around two children survived uh, out of uh, uh, slightly about four in Denmark. Um, so this was a period of stability in population terms, uh, where uh, although we had quite large families, uh, half of the children, uh, slightly more, uh, died before uh, reproducing themselves. And, and as mortality fell, the, uh, the blue and the red lines gradually converged because most children, when had survived uh, to mid-reproductive periods. But in the meantime, you had a, a, a period where you, you saw um, net fertility being um, above two. And this was the entire demographic transition. This is the reason why we have population growth in the world, because this occurred to uh, countries all over the world. In Denmark, it's quite easy. The population increased from one to five million. It increased by a factor of five during the demographic transition, uh, which is quite typical for the European case. 
uh, European population has increased on average around a factor of four, uh, much less in some countries such as France, where it roughly doubled, as you can see on, on, the, uh, on the French uh, diagram here, and, but did not decrease, uh, increase very high, and the reason is it has to do with uh, the fact that mortality declined slowly, so populations uh, uh, um, women have time to adjust and, and take into account that the greater proportion of the women are likely to, a uh, greater proportion of the children are likely to survive. However, in other parts of the world, including in India, including in China, Singapore, Kuwait, for example, is given here, um, the changes were, were different for two reasons. One, gross fertility, the number of children one had was not four to five, which was the case in the European uh, setting where you had the so-called European marital pattern, one married late, uh, had uh, high levels of uh, uh, pre-marital celibacy and um, significant portions of populations never married and had children. Uh, in many other parts of the world, uh, gross fertility was higher. and one had six, seven children on average uh, in many countries. And when mortality fell, it also fell much quicker. And this implied that one had a much, much quicker increase in uh, population size, size, meaning that unlike the European case, uh, where populations increased by factor four, accounting for immigration to Australia, New Zealand, uh, the US, Canada, and other countries, you had uh, in many countries, including India and China, a much stronger population increase. At the same time, in recent years, such as in Singapore, uh, fertility has fallen to levels uh, much below what has been seen uh, anywhere in Europe. Uh, and um, same with Hong Kong, same with Taiwan, same with um, also now different parts of um, India. So you, you have a very a more extreme change occurring, which makes um, studying Asia particularly interesting. How many children could, one, could a woman have? Uh, well, it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, there's enormous variation. Uh, one often states that natural fertility, given that one has unprotected sex during one's reproductive life, marries partners young, uh, one ends up with perhaps seven to 10 children per woman on average. About half of women uh, in uh, communities where this occurs, like the Hutterites in the US, uh, religious community, which has this kind of um, um, partnering patterns, had the last child in, in the age 41 to 50, and very few, only around 1 to 3 percent, remain childless. So biological childlessness, based on these estimates, tend to be very low. But there's huge variation between individuals. And according to the Guinness Book of World, Book of World Records, uh, Valentina Vasilev, uh, who was alive in the 18th century, had 69 children. Uh, she was pregnant 27 times, gave birth to 16 pairs of twins, seven sets of triplets, and four sets of quadru uh, quadruplets. So fertility can be very high for some. Uh, but on average, uh, seven to 10 children is uh, what commonly stated as uh, natural fertility. Uh, there has been widespread concern, um, at least in the media, about uh, declining biological ability to reproduce. So, um, and, and one, uh, at least in many Western countries, has been uh, much concerned about a potential decline in semen quality. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, an example from, uh, from a study that looks at like North America, Europe, which, which arguably finds a declining semen quality over time, uh, over the 20th century. But these studies, we, we do not really have good representative data on semen quality. Data on semen quality is often taken from uh, fecundity centers, fertility centers, and that's a select population who visits these clinics. So it's difficult to state uh, what, uh, what the actual trend is. And even if these trends are true, they're still uh, quite uh, a lot higher than the, than the um, uh, uh, cutoff for, for what is seen as, uh, as uh, sufficient semen quality for reproduction is, which is 15 uh, million per uh, million uh, semen per milliliter. So it's difficult to state. What we do have much better data on is uh, data uh, on um, data on um, on the age of first uh, menstruation, and we do have uh, uh, historical data in Norway going back to the early 19th century, um, or mid 19th century, finding that it has decreased by three years over time, uh, from, from around six, um, 16 to, to uh, around age 13 and below. Uh, we also know that the average health has been improving uh, for both men and women in the key reproductive ages. 
Um, and they do have much better reproductive technologies than, uh, than earlier. So for, for example, no, we know more than um, one, uh, four or five percent of, uh, of all children are born using assisted reproductive technologies. On average, one child, at least one child in each school class in Norway has, has been born through the use of ART. However, social factors might be important and reproduction has been postponed to later life where fecundity tends to be lower. There are many reasons for this and social factors are the primary drivers. Most individuals uh, prefer to have children, prefer childlessness it tends to be below 10% uh, for almost all countries except men in Austria and Netherlands and uh, for women in all countries uh, uh, when asked. So if you prefer to be childless, but there are so many things to do before having children which takes more and more time. And this includes, includes education, finding a secure job, uh, getting married, having, having enough money, buying a house, a car, spending a year traveling, uh, realizing oneself, playing the dating field, finding the perfect partner, moving in together. It all takes more and more time than it used to. And this is uh, uh, something which uh, uh, some of us have been working on a lot in the past, educational increases. It has increased tremendously over recent years. Uh, school lineages increase and career establishments take longer and longer. At the same time, peak earnings for where you have data occurs later and later in life. Historical data suggests that one, uh, for example, from, from Finland or, or England, uh, suggests that one reached one's peak earnings around the age of 30, and now it typically happens in one's late 50s or 60s way later than one's peak reproductive years. So it's uh, economically more difficult than earlier. Uh, it's uh, one in 562 that are also finding uh, a partner, given with those desired characteristics, given what one prefers. Uh, according to a UK-based study, it's very difficult to find the perfect partner. Um, dating sites have no incentive to create stable partnerships. That is against the business ID. And, uh, um, New factors such as education and income are just more and more for likelihood of marriage, personality traits, physical strength even, um, at the same time as many prefer traditional gender norms. Even in Norway, uh, one service suggests that 7 out of 10 women prefer men to be the uh, main breadwinner, uh, which can be hard, uh, and in more and more cases, men earn less than women. So one has to adjust one's uh, uh, mating preferences. This is an example from Taiwan, and you find that childlessness is very different by men and women. Uh, men with higher education are less likely to be childless. Women with higher education are more likely to be childless than um, uh, those with less education. There's been changes in marriage patterns. More people have it, fewer people marry. Uh, even in countries that traditionally had none of this, uh, such as Chile, Costa Rica, it has become the dominant norm. So it could increase also in countries that are traditionally very conservative in these matters. Cohabitation, non-marital childbearing uh, might increase. Uh, there might be new forms of family formation. This is examples from Sweden, where you looked at same-sex couples, um, and you find that um, um, women with wives tend to have an increase increasing childbearing. Uh, this is not the case for same-sex male couples who tend to have very low fertility. This might play an increasing role uh, if it um, constitutes a large proportion of those uh, of the partnerships in that country. Earnings, uh, housing prices matter a lot. Uh, this is again an example from Norway. Accounting for earnings, um, earnings growth, uh, housing prices have tripled uh, since the mid-1990s, making it harder to establish oneself. This is certainly also very relevant for India, where uh, housing prices have increased tremendously in recent years. So summing up, it takes a long time. One wants to do a lot of things, and one ends up with challenges. Antenatal policies, uh, in contrast to pronatal policies, could often be quite effective. This is an example from Iran, where it decreased from six to two, um, two children per woman in, in uh, just uh, over a decade or so. Um, similar examples of very effective anti-natal policies have been uh, shown from Bangladesh. And, and you find, um, um, unlike pro-natal policies, which tends to, wants to increase fertility, uh, anti-natal policies tend to be more likely to have strong effects. Example from Hong Kong, which went from very high to one of the world's lowest fertility levels. Lowest currently being South Korea, with 0.8 children. So 
So if I to bet, I think uh, fertility will like to fluctuate at fairly low levels in more and more world regions. And new factors coming up, including, uh, for example, climate change, is likely to depress fertility further. This is uh, 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 whether this will have consequences for the world. Uh, in, I think there are many positive likely consequences, uh, but I also think uh, there are major concerns, especially from our own profession, the economist, uh, about the implications for global productivity. Uh, but for the first time in history now that India's dropped below fertility uh, replacement levels, the world's 10 largest economies have below replacement fertility levels. So, uh, more, actually it has increased to the world's 15 largest economies, I didn't uh, have time to update the graph. But more, m the vast majority of what's produced in the world is now being produced in countries with below replacement fertility. And if you're interested in some of these uh, topics, um, as a little bit of advertisement, I, I did write, write a book which just came out now, uh, termed Decline and Prosper, on why we have a lot fewer children uh, and some of the issues we should investigate further and why, why the consequences might be uh, possibly more positive than many people would think. So uh, um, uh, this, this uh, and, and unlike most past research in, the, in, in this field, which tends to be very this panel specific, some are experts on say semen quality or education, or I try to merge everything together in, in one uh, integrated analysis. And one word on aging. Uh, so um, there's a lot of concern about uh, aging in the world, but I think it's extremely important to stress that, for example, the world's oldest country, um, Japan, also has very good health. So if you look at the age, not when you turn 65, but the age when you have the same health as a global 65 year old, you find that this occurs in the late 70s in Japan, uh, while it occurs in the mid 40s in Papua New Guinea. There's tremendous difference across countries, India being around 60, which means India has a lot to go on in terms of improving health and thereby dealing better with population aging. If you look at the old age dependency ratio, which is the um, proportion 65 plus over uh, those ages 20 to 64, you find that uh, countries such as Sub-Saharan Africa, most of Asia um, tend to be relatively young, have a low dependency ratio, but one should not do this, one should not use this, one should rather you look at when people get old in terms of when they have poor health. And if you, if you account for health, if you, look, if you don't say a person is old at the age of 65, but when a person has, has relatively poor health, um, you find a completely different world rank ordering. You find that India's actually not in a sort of mid-level. Um, uh, several European countries, which dem with demographically much older populations, are uh, younger because they have better health. They invested more in lifelong health, um, and uh, and uh, some countries have neither, including former uh, USSR Soviet countries, where they both have an old population and poor health, and they have very poor. Uh, health adjusted dependency ratio. So to sum up, global fertility has been cut in half in just the last 50 years and it's continuing to fall. Lower mortality, education, higher costs of childbearing, uh, changes in the labor market, new roles of women have likely contributed to these changes and uh, uh, people prefer fewer children than they used to. There is a lack of examples of countries that have managed to reverse this fertility trend and most like future events are likely to, to uh, if anything, depress fertility even further. So I think if low fertility will probably uh, be a trend um, of the future increasingly and also, um, as mentioned earlier, it might be less of a concern but rather more positive development than, um, than what maybe others believe. So thank you so much for your attention and um, um, I look forward to any comments or questions. something called the irreversibility of fertility transition once it is achieved it's very very unlikely that it may go back to a higher fertility scenario so typically meaning that you might not see many gardens in this country which is playing with a lot of children in the past we may not see anything in the future we may see many older people sitting in this garden and talking compared to what we have experienced perhaps during our childhood in this country so it's very exciting to really see what's really happening at the different countries across the globe. Thank you for that exciting talk. I'm sure we will have a 
discussion. But before that discussion takes place, let us start the launch of the World Population Day prospects first, and which will be followed by the U.S. Minister's comments on the World Population Day, uh, World Population Prospects 2022. So to launch, we will have a video from the United Nations, which is by the on the new World Population Day prospects, which has been going to be released today, and we are having the regional launch of this project. So over to the. In 1950, there were many more children than older persons. From 1950 to 2050, however, we expect the population above age 65 to grow from 5 to 16 percent of the total. By 2100, it is projected that the global population above age 65 will be considerably larger than the population below age 15. Countries with aging populations should take steps to adapt public programs to the growing number of older persons. Today, two-thirds of the global population lives in a country or territory where lifetime fertility is below 2.1 births per woman, roughly the level required for zero growth over the long term. Some of these countries have experienced long periods of very low fertility, below one and a half births per woman. As a result, the populations of 61 countries or areas are projected to decrease by 1% or more between 2022 and 2050. Population change in high-income countries is increasingly driven by international migration. Over the next few decades, migration will be the sole driver of population growth for this group of countries. For low-income and lower-middle-income countries, population increase is driven by an excess of births over deaths, which is much larger than the net outflow of migrants. Whether they are experiencing net inflows or outflows of migrants, all countries should take steps to ensure that such movements are safe, orderly, and regular. The COVID-19 pandemic has had significant demographic consequences affecting all components of population change, including mortality, fertility, and migration. Global life expectancy fell 1.8 years between 2019 and 2021, due to excess mortality associated with the pandemic. The impact of the pandemic on fertility is less clear-cut. For some countries, there is evidence of pandemic-related fluctuations in births. Elsewhere, it appears that the pandemic did not noticeably affect the trend in births. The pandemic severely restricted all forms of human mobility, including international migration. In the world population prospects of 2022, the pandemic's impact is reflected in the estimates for 2020 and 2021, and in the first few years of the projections starting in 2022. A path towards a more sustainable future requires demographic foresight, which involves anticipating and analyzing major population shifts before and while they occur, and adopting forward-looking and proactive policies guided by such analysis. You can find additional information about the global population on the website of the United Nations Population Division. This is an occasion for this institution, a very prominent occasion to not merely celebrate, but also make people aware of population concern. If I am reminded of a few years back at the same place, I was invited to give a talk on World Population Day and I chose a topic which was relevance of demographers in the social scientist community then. Many of you who were present then would have seen that in fact 
it is very much responsible and actually comment on the world population prospect which is released and you got a highlight of it just now from the UN division. Before I begin, I will start with this that basically a world of 8 billion which is almost near and the message that for this world population day like any other world population day there is a message which comes saying that we want a resilient future with guaranteeing, you know, ensuring rights, choices, equity and many other ideal things. Will this be possible is the, is the challenge, is the challenge. Many occasions which are celebrated as specific days for specific cause and events, World Population Day is one. But I wanted to say that it is just a mere commemoration of the event that happened in 1987 or it is a reiteration of commitment to sustain a growing population which all of us agree that as you see even if growth has slowed down population is going to grow. And the consensus that I am trying to share with you today is more to dwell upon not merely count of population. What is more relevant is composition characteristics of population which has been actually changing drastically and getting recognized least by others, of course not by demographers, but least by others. And I'll come to that in a while. Size and composition, population concentration around the world, the kind of urbanization scenario that is evolving around the world. When people link population to development, how much do they talk about size and, and its growing you know, intensity? Added to that, you have concerns on environment, you have concerns on food and employment. If you look at every of these domains, the major crux lies in population. And we are those pioneers who have to inform and inform responsibly about what population count means or understanding of population prospect means. Having said that, I come to the first concern that is imbalance in population. I don't know how many of you have been through a most recently controversial and contentious report released which was in debate and discussion on World Inequality Report 2021. The World Inequality Report 2021 and a very interesting piece written by Chancellor and Piketty on this issue that how is population distribution related to inequality talks about population share in the world. Look at the 8 billion strength of population and its composition around the world. A particular population where a country has availability of something or not and what we do, we say if this is available more, that is available less to make provisioning of anything as a connection with population density, the cost of it. And this is a parameter I do not see that frequently being, being related to when we read development. And that's the reason that imbalance of population distribution around the world and around the world as you know every other day there is a report comes out, international report where there is inter-country comparisons. The inter-country comparisons are simply simplistic rather than being more comparatively critical when it comes to population distribution. And that is the reason that it is not merely the news making headline of India surpassing China's population in 2023 or countries of Sub-Saharan Africa will be sharing 50% of the world's population by the turn of the next, this century. That's not important. What's more important is this imbalance and its density which is contentious and needs to be accounted for when we compare indicators or deep development across. The second issue is, yes, there is a very big anxiety about population stabilization, whether it is within India, whether after 
replacement level of fertility being attained in our country. We are also more anxious about when will India's population stabilize and when will world's population stabilize. Of course, new students to this institute may not be aware of what population stabilization, which will be taught to you, of course. But population stabilization is an anxiety which is having some hope in this world population prospect document. And what is that optimism about population stabilization is that population has declined 1% in 61 nations, but this is a count, but which nations, what population size is a different issue altogether. Two-thirds of global population is in a low fertility environment, as Professor Begard rightly told, that low fertility is the key area of inquiry now, that because two-thirds of global population is in that environment, which gives us hope that there will be population stabilization soon. But I say that these are two optimistic viewpoints about population stabilization is going to happen. Environment which gives us hope that there will be population stabilization soon. But I say that these are two optimistic viewpoints about population stabilization is going to happen. When and how accurately is a question. We do predict that population stabilization will happen for each of the different countries of the world at different points in time. But I also have this little bit doubt about there are nations where population decline has started. The size of the population will be so small that given the current world order, even I suspect that will that be a threat to sovereignty of states. That's also an important dimension which we need to inform people as to what is optimal population size of a country and what kind of a population size need to be maintained. After this, I come to some of the, what I could do in a very short while reading this World Population Prospect document is that one of the things which has assumed very, very wide significance with demographic transition is aging and I talk about aging derivative of the World Population Prospect released. Often, you know, it has been from my student days till that demographers are so count biased that actually we always get very excited in giving some counts, you know, in terms of how much will be the population, what will be the share. When it comes to a segmented component of population like aged, we give a count, we give a share, we inform that this will happen. Also, addition to that, what we do, we compare a particular segment that is aged, defined on any normative age criteria and say compare it with the children, compare it with the other segment of the population, as you can see I have written that. In fact, this loses out on two things, which I emphasize very often and in many of the research papers I give a comment when actually somebody compares, whether it is cross-sectional, whether it is temporal, is there a characteristics equivalence made? Are elderly of one reason comparable with other? This has been already among researchers recognized that aging count or aging assessment of a population needs to be characteristics equivalent whether it is about roles and functions, whether it is about dependency, whether it is about good health, many other domains. But that has led to a new area now of research called multidimensional measurement of or multidimensional characteristics adjustment of the elderly count. In addition to that, I wanted to reflect one thing here, which is very important for us to recognize as demographers. As demographers, we count a particular segment of the population, which I refer to here as aged, but the phenomenon of aging has a very two distinct dimension. One is population aging versus individual aging. A few years back, I coined a terminology to assess aging called youthness lost in a population, just the reverse of it. If in a population I ask what is the youthness lost, now I have to not construct a youthness index, but I have to actually compare the cumulative age composition of the population to compare that what is the degree of youthness lost if either I am comparing temporal population composition of a country or I am comparing cross-sectional, making cross-sectional comparison across countries. That brings 
that population aging should be read in that way. But individual aging is completely different from population aging because I say population aging is a structural construct and individual aging is a survival construct. A survival construct need to be completely read differently from a, a structural construct. So when you talk about population aging, you talk on a structural construct. But when you talk about individual aging, you talk about a survival construct. So this is what is available in world population prospect on aging derivative, which tells the kind of comparison of a segmented population and its relation to other segments like children, like adults and the age structural change. This does not cover the second component which I talked about individual aging, which is a survival construct altogether. I'll come to it because that is another interesting facet which needs to be, be actually discussed. This is another highlight in the World Population Prospect report which has come is that international migration is it the balancer. As I began speaking, I told you there is an apparent imbalance in population strengths around the world. Certain regions are very highly populated, highly densely populated and certain regions are not. It is not merely the density but also the age composition because of the status of demographic transition attained in different countries. You have activity, whether it is about roles and functions, whether it is about dependency, whether it is about good health, many other domains. But that has led to a new area now of research called multidimensional measurement of or multidimensional characteristics adjustment of the elderly count. In addition to that, I wanted to reflect one thing here which is very important for us to recognize as demographers. As demographers, we count a particular segment of the population which I refer to here as aged. But the phenomenon of aging has a very two distinct dimension. One is population aging versus individual aging. A few years back, I coined a terminology to assess aging called youthness lost in a population. Just the reverse of it. If in a population I ask what is the youthness lost, now I have to not construct a youthness index, but I have to actually compare the cumulative age composition of the population to compare that what is the degree of youthness lost if either I am comparing temporal population composition of a country or I am comparing cross sectional, making cross sectional comparison across countries. That brings that population aging should be read in that way. But individual aging is completely different from population aging because I say population aging is a structural construct and individual aging is a survival construct. A survival construct need to be completely read differently from a, a structural construct. So when you talk about population aging, you talk on a structural construct but when you talk about individual aging, you talk about a survival construct. So this is what is available in World Population Prospect on Aging Derivative, which tells the kind of comparison of a segmented population and its relation to other segments like children, like adults and the age structural change. This does not cover the second component which I talked about individual aging, which is a survival construct altogether. I'll come to it because that is another interesting facet which needs to be, be actually discussed. This is another highlight in the World Population Prospect report which has come is that international migration is it the balancer. As I began speaking, I told you there is an apparent imbalance in population strengths around the world. Certain regions are very highly populated, highly densely populated and certain regions are not. It is not merely the density but also the age composition because of the status of demographic transition attained in different countries. You have international migration expected to serve as a balancer. But what you see that literally despite having low fertility, some countries have migration which is playing the role in economic, I mean in, in, in the population growth. Whereas, 
that is not so much high in the countries where actually people aspire to go. You are all aware that we all want to go. People are eager to go to the United States of America, UK. These are not the countries which are having immigration policies, encouraging immigration policies in terms of substituting or balancing their a structure of the population, which otherwise is adverse. I must tell you why do that happen. If you have read Piketty's argument, he says that actually more than labor, capital can move seamlessly around the world. Is it the balancer? As I began speaking, I told you there is an apparent imbalance in population strengths around the world. Certain regions are very highly populated, highly densely populated and certain regions are not. It is not merely the density but also the age composition because of the status of demographic transition attained in different countries. You have international migration expected to serve as a balancer. But what you see that literally despite having low fertility, some countries have migration which is playing the role in economic, I mean in, in, in the population growth. Whereas that is not so much high in the countries where actually people aspire to go. You are all aware that we all want to go. People are eager to go to the United States of America, UK. These are not the countries which are having immigration policies, encouraging immigration policies in terms of substituting or balancing their a structure of the population, which otherwise is adverse. I must tell you why do that happen. If you have read Piketty's argument, he says that actually more than labor, capital can move seamlessly around the world. Capital comes to labor surplus regions to be multiplied. But labor cannot go to the region where actually there is a labor shortage. Therefore, what happens is that you will have always this scenario that in labor surplus reason, capital will get multiplied and capital will move very seamlessly around the world. So the rich nations will remain rich and the underdeveloped nations will remain underdeveloped and will be blamed for the fact that there is a higher population count. So population balance can always be achieved and will be achieved whether today or tomorrow because there will be a need for human resources for sustainability in certain regions which are arising in some of the countries and which will intensify more worse in due course and therefore I, I see that in fact it is important to recognize and inform seriously about the population structural imbalance which is there around few of the countries they need to have liberal immigration policies to balance the population structure around the world countries otherwise. Coming to this domain, which is also a very celebrated domain and a matter of pride for us, that we have attained nine years of gain, of gain in life expectancy in a period of 30 years globally. From the period 1990 to 2019, we have gained nine years of life expectancy. When it is told, it sounds pretty good that you know, human survivorship has become better, we are going to live longer and human uh, existence will be much longer and we expect further length of longevity of life. But this gain which you see is not a gain, it's an aggregate gain. And this gain has an underlying disparity whether you talk about across the countries in the world or you talk about, yes, there is a saying that there is a convergence. This is a very ideal word to use that there is a convergence in survivorship across the countries and you know we are almost going to live as long as anywhere else. Like India's gain in life expectancy is also celebrated. But one challenge it puts forth which is very crucial to recognize, to be recognized by demographers is that there is a rich poor divide in survivorship. There is a group divide in survivorship. And you know, in this current sustainable development goal environment, what is the contribution that demographers make every day and we are demanded for a generation of indicators. Generation of indicators should have a denominator. And this denominator is nothing but population. That population itself 
is having a rich poor divide in life expectancy will lead to the fact that the population will have more of the rich than the poor. They are not equal. Poors die before they come into the count. Poors are not available in your denominator. In your denominator, the adversity indicators that you compute for 101 adversity indicators, those adversity facing or adversity likelihood itself, people who have, they are less. So you get an elusive count or elusive measurement of improvement in adversity indicators that you face every day. So for as a demographer, I am inclined to say that do we actually recognize this? Do we even count the complexity of population count when there is a division and a disparity in terms of attainment of life expectancy? In fact, the rich poor divide, I didn't speak here on ideal ground alone. I was informed at a point in time by a celebrated economist saying that our poverty ratios coming down is because poor people are becoming lesser, you are attaining achievement in declining poverty or poor people are dead. If poor people are dead also, they are not found in your numerator anyway. So are you saying that declining in poverty is basically because of the fact that poor people perish before even they attain a certain age? It is the, that is not the ideal concern I am global imbalance becoming more and more skewed in terms of population share across world regions and if you look at the income shares they are more than double of the population share. I am not going into any computation of strict inequality measure but globally you have income share which is double than the population share itself says that how much of inequality we have and we talk about sustaining equal and population well-being across and the world is really an elusive matter. It's important to see that how will we attain that balance, how will we achieve that. In fact, inequality is also not the result of mere tangible, I'm not talking of wealth, I'm not talking of income, I'm talking of endowments, I'm talking of capability endowments that themselves are so unequal that that will actually reproduce inequality. It will go on reproducing inequality, it will go on reproducing income differences. Inclination, inclination and aspiration to migrate. Reason is imbalance in income, imbalance in wealth. That is the reason that people move away and that also is regulated to the worst terms possible. So population prospects when we read, we should not read merely in terms of the population share and distribution not its unevenness but also its implication for global inequality. And that is the point that I wanted to make. Having made these very brief points, provoking points, what demographers' responsibility is about when it comes to reading population prospect, I say that population prospect quite important in formulating indicators. That is one message because it is not merely taking the population denominator, but sensitizing people about what are the nuances underlying that population denominator in terms of its composition, in terms of its equivalence characteristics and the rest. Count of population is necessary but not sufficient. Given that recognition of their composition makes robust comparability of generated indicators. So this is an assignment for all of us to question the prevailing indicators and their robustness in comparison when it comes to characteristics equivalence of population, whether it's over time or across population. Another is that global imbalance in population and wealth makes a call for seamless movement of labor similar to that of capital. If it is done, then we will be perhaps be achieving the dreams that we talk of, that we have a balanced world population with equivalent well-being all around. So the take home for you is that anything Good morning, Professor James, the director of IIPS, Professor T.V. Shekhar and Dr. Govind, the coordinators for this symposium. 
distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me virtually today. World Population Day offers a moment to celebrate human progress. Our world, despite its challenges, is one where higher shares of people are educated and live healthier lives than at any previous point in history. Societies that invest in their people, in their rights and choices, have proven time and again that this is the road to the prosperity and peace that everyone wants and deserves. The total number of people in the world now tops 8 billion. In an ideal world, 8 billion people means 8 billion opportunities for healthier societies empowered by rights and choices. Some will marvel at the advancements in health that have extended lifespans, reduced maternal mortality and child mortality, and given rise to vaccine development in record time. Others will tout the technological innovations that have eased our lives and connected us more than ever. Still others will herald the gains in gender equality, but the playing field is not and has never been even. Based on gender, ethnicity, class, religion, sexual orientation, disability and origin, among other factors, too many are still exposed to discrimination, harassment and violence. We do ourselves no favor when neglecting those that are left behind. For the first time in history, we are seeing extreme diversity in the mean age of countries and the fertility rates of populations. While the populations of a growing number of countries are aging, and about 60% of the world's population live in countries with below replacement fertility of 2.1 children per woman, other countries have huge youth populations and keep growing apace. Women are still dying in childbirth. Gender gaps remain entrenched. The digital divide leaves more women and those in developing countries offline. Most recently, COVID-19 vaccines remain unevenly distributed. And the same concerns and challenges raised 11 years ago remain or have worsened. I refer to climate change, violence and discrimination. According to the United Nations Department, of economic and social affairs, even though the pace of global population growth will continue to decline in the coming decades, the world population is likely to be 20 and 30 percent larger in 2050 than in 2020. Having accurate estimates of population trends and reliable forecasts for future changes including for the size of the populations, their distributions by age, sex, and geographical location is required for policy formulation and implementation, and as a guide to assist countries in following a path towards sustainable development. If, for example, fertility is falling, we should ask, is it because prospective parents worry about how they will provide for a family, find affordable living space, or how going on maternity leave might hamper a mother's career trajectory. If fertility is rising, on the other hand, is it by choice or because women don't have the knowledge of or access to modern contraception? Recent surveys show that in a majority of Indian states also, Fertility rate has fallen well below the replacement level of 2.1, and the country is fast approaching the replacement level itself. The total fertility rate of India in 2017 stood at 
And according to the data from the National Family Health Survey 5, which is NFHS 5, India's total fertility rate dropped below the replacement level of 2.1 and currently stands at 2.0, with urban areas pegged at 1.6. The fertility rate of Maharashtra also fell gradually from two live births per woman in 2007 to 1.7 live births per woman in 2018. While total fertility rate, that is the average number of children born to a woman over her lifetime, the TFR, is dipping across the country. Data from the same NFHS 5 shows that female sterilization is the most common method of contraception. While female sterilization increased in most states from, let's say, 49% to 58% in Tamil Nadu and from 21% to 35% in Maharashtra, in Bihar, I'm sorry, Maharashtra posted a slight drop from 50% to 49%. If we have a look at disaggregated data within the state of Maharashtra, Mumbai, the island city, follows the national trend of more sterilization, that is up from 36% to 47%, while the suburbs of Mumbai have shown a drop from 43% to 38%. The male participation in family planning has always been a problem at the country and at the state level. Again, as per NFHS 5, 74% of couples practice contraception as against nearly 60% that did in, in according to NFHS 4. Couples who adopted condoms also rose from 5.6% to 9.6% in NFHS 5. In Maharashtra 2, it increased from 7.1% to 10.2% over the two NFHS survey periods. While the increase in the use of modern contraceptive methods is heartening, an increase in female sterilization coupled with continued stagnation in male sterilization uptake shows that the heavy lifting in the family planning program is still done by the women. Therefore, focus should be on people, not population. Reducing people to numbers strips them of their humanity instead of making the numbers work for the systems, make the systems work for the numbers by promoting the health and the well-being of the people. Making sure that everyone is counted can allow governments to better assess the needs of a changing population and chart a surer path to addressing those needs for demographic resilience. Achieving this demographic resilience starts with the commitment to counting not just numbers of people, but also opportunities for progress and barriers that stand in its way. This calls for transforming discriminatory norms that hold individuals and societies back. It leads us to economies that work for all people instead of just a few, and to a fair use of resources so that we can mitigate risks and meet the needs of both the current and the future generations. Now, let me talk of UNICEF and how we work for the story behind the numbers and attempt to make the systems work for the numbers by promoting the health and the well being of the people. It is a happy coincidence that UNICEF is celebrating 75 years of work globally, 73 years of which are in India. Our main goal has been in ensuring children survive and thrive in all stages of life. They are nourished, they are educated, and they are aware of their rights to make informed decisions as they grow up. The last 73 years of our work in India inform us that as we strive to achieve our goals for children, that geographical scenarios political and administrative commitments and committed resources for women and children are fundamental in achieving these goals. Some states like Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and Kerala 
have indeed been pioneering in their commitment, while a few other states, despite that commitment, struggle due to various reasons linked to resource allocation and other local challenges. UNICEF works largely in the rural areas, and we have seen that the robust administrative systems are set up that are uh, geared towards uh, a very good understanding of the issues and how to address them. I am reminded of my visit to Nandurbar district of Maharashtra, which is a 70% tribal district, and I vividly recall in the remote interiors of Akalpur block that an Anganwadi Sevika was able to scientifically distinguish and measure severely and moderately acute malnourished children and counsel mothers on the same. We have penetrated deep inside the rural hinterlands and are now able to measure our training and knowledge building capacities of the government frontline workers and other staff and also know where the hotspots are for the problem and how we can clearly strategize for the varied geographies and the varied communities within the government. This is but one example of how systems work for the numbers, as I had mentioned earlier to you. And now as we stand, India has the proud distinction of eradicating polio, smallpox, and maternal tetanus, largely due to the system's strengthening and investments made. I would like to take up for today's talk the issue of rapidly urbanizing India, where the municipalities and the urban population living within them lack the similar investments in systems. Take, for instance, Maharashtra, whose population, as per census 2011, is approximately 11.24 crores, of which 6.15 crores is rural and 5.08 crores is urban. Although urban appears to be lesser than rural, the growth of urban population from 1961 to 2011 has been phenomenal. In 1961, the rural population was 2.84 crores which increased by 117% to 6.15 crores, while for urban areas, it was 1.12 crores only in 1961. And the percentage increase was a huge 354% in 2011. Questions arise now. Are we now ready to address the issues of the urban poor? Do we have clear strategies for addressing the multiple challenges faced by the urban poor, starting from health to their economics and their well-being? UNICEF's work for the urban was initiated in 2019 and have been geared to understanding four things. One, what is the current evidence that informs the challenges and opportunities for the urban poor? Two, what are the ground level issues of the communities? Three, what is the participation level of both the civil society organizations and the communities? And lastly, four, how can we trigger local change with the government? As the urban landscape is evolving, UNICEF Maharashtra has identified five key priority areas for children in urban settings that will inform our work. Priority area one is to support the public health department and the national urban health mission in reducing the equity gaps in urban areas through partnership for urban primary health care program. Priority area two is to strengthen the evidence on children in urban areas for data, policy and research. Priority area three is to enhance the voice and the participation of poor children living in urban settings and strengthen the partnership with urban communities and organizations. Priority area four is to adapt urban planning and budgeting for children living in urban settings, particularly the most disadvantaged. Priority area five 
is to promote a safe and sustainable urban environment for children through larger advocacy and partnerships with the civil society, the NGOs, and the private sector. These priorities have been identified as being critical to realizing the rights of the children living in the urban poor settings, particularly the most disadvantaged, and as areas where UNICEF is uniquely placed to act, to build on the mandate, the expertise, and the experience. I do hope that the theme of the World Population Day 2022, the demographic resilience, as highlighted in my talk, helps us to reimagine a world where we are each much more than a number. Numbers do matter, but let's count them carefully. A resilient world of 8 billion, a world that upholds individual rights and choices, offers infinite possibilities. Possibilities for people, for societies, and our shared planet to thrive and prosper. I am privileged to be speaking at today's symposium organized by IIPS in the context of the World Population Day 2022 and allowing me to highlight UNICEF's priorities for children as a contribution to the overall theme. Thank you for your patience.